Yeah, hi, I'm Ian from Nokia Bell Labs, and I, I, I'm going to keep this presentation at a fairly high, high level. We get, okay, we, I, I'm just going to turn the sound off my side, because there's a huge uh, delay um, going on here, this is kind of weird. Okay, so I've been working with um, safety critical systems uh, in, the, in the past couple of years, and for the past six, seven years with uh, trusted computing, and specifically remote att attestation. So, um, pretty simply, I, I've been working with medical systems and railway uh, technologies, and uh, the, the amount of digitalization going on there, as you can imagine, is immense. I mean, if you take your average uh, sort of ventilator device today, you pull the thing open, you'll find a number of boards inside there, typically ARM, IMX, Intel processors, whatever. They're, they're a small distributed system in their own right, albeit uh, a rather tightly coupled one. Uh, so we've got other work going on here and turning these into uh, 5G and 6G edge clouds in their own right. Railways, similarly, you know, the whole move towards ERTMS level three, completely um, track infrastructure less, no, so no physical signals, everything running through digital twins, communication over 5G, you know, signaling communication over 5G networks, um, the amount of competing power in there, uh, the amount of places where you can actually get in firmware attacks of any form becomes rather immense. Um, and of course, well, you, you, you can guess what can go wrong here. I mean, I don't need to tell you much more about this. Um, this year, I, th this is what I like to call um, how the world ends. So before we start talking about crashing trains and destroying hospitals, etc., uh, this is a flood detection center uh, sensor that I found in the bathroom of a university in a Nordic country a few years back. It was on the floor. Um, there were wires come out of it, so uh, good, any good security researcher, I ripped it off the wall because I didn't know what it, what it was. Um, I don't recommend you do this um, as, a, as an everyday thing. There's nothing much to it. It's just a water sensor. It communicates over um, some wireless protocol. I'm guessing um, uh, maybe Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, something. I think it's an ESP32 inside, uh, and it talks to the building management system. Um, you see that there are there are six pins available. These are the reflashing re pins for the JTAG. Uh, so I can put whatever software on this. And if you think that writing your own uh, firmware onto a water detection uh, IoT device um, in in a in a bathroom somewhere is isn't particularly interesting, just think it's exactly these same devices that were attacked. Um, in you know Triton, Stuxnet, etc. I mean, th there is no difference between these devices and the ones that we can write new firmware to in any kind of industrial um, in installation. So this is how the world ends, and because quite simply, we do not even have protection at this level. Um, we still believe in perimeter security, and in the case of Stuxnet, that was a single Windows update machine that was uh, bypassed to write new hardware to to guys like this. Um, I work on the intersection of security and safety. Um, we, we use a concept called dynamicity criticality to figure out these systems. Um, dynamic systems aren't very good in trusted computing because we like to have everything static and known beforehand. Um, turns out that all the cool uh, safety critical systems aren't that dynamic, um, aviation, rail, automotive, although they are becoming more so. In the medical um, domain, of course, things are very dynamic. Um, if you look at medical devices now, you can actually move these around uh, quite rapidly. Uh, there's this huge move to get rid of cabling and so on. So everything becomes wireless, open, perimeter security becomes an absolute nightmare. Um, and typically none of these devices have security in the first place uh, to start off with. So things become very, very easy from to attack. Um, so that, that's the context we work in. So what, what I've been doing for quite a while now is to actually look at what, what we have in place. So my main research has been looking at um, remote attestation, applying this technology in service systems, edge, 5G, et cetera. But we, we've spent quite a lot of time on looking at the context in which we're in. And I think we, we all know um, the, the, the general platform that we're running and the general tools that we have. I mean, we've already talked about Open Titan, TPM. We've got CPU enclaving, Secure Boot, and all its various forms. We've got U-Boot, Linux Boot, uh, Wolf, Wolf Boot, Wolf TPM as libraries for dealing with the firmware. Um, modern Linux is modern Windows support. All these features, we've got great tools for it. There's a lot of hypervisor environments out there that support this. Um, and 
now we're starting to see workload management and management operations of cloud environments starting to take advantage of this. And this is the core that we're starting from. Um, and what, what, what we've decided over the years is we're not going to tamper with this core. There are plenty of extremely intelligent people who know how the, this, this part of the stack works. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into let's design TPM 3.0. It, 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 it's pointless. Open at, um, remote attestation, however, has been around for quite a while. In a previous session, we, we talked about people working on it from around 2007, 2008. We worked with Intel's open attestation. We've done work with Keyline, Chara, and so on, uh, the IBM tools around this. And we, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how does remote attestation even fit in with, say, um, a classic server environment where you've got a machine room with you know, 100,000 servers in and so on. And we had a lot of very, very nice results come out of that and got, got into very heavily into things like uh, vir virtual network function, workload management, placement of virtual images, TPM pinning, and all this. What we've been doing in the past couple of years is actually um, reevaluating this concept and saying, well, actually, we should have proper interfaces for attestation environments. Um, we, we have a prototype. Um, environment where we have a, a, a standard set of APIs for remote attestation. We have a backend that's basically intent-based. We don't care about the layer six, layer seven protocols. So we can work with RATS, EAT, we can talk to TPM, we could talk to open type. And as long as you've got interfaces to the tools, um, we can come up with a very, very nice layer seven protocol that says, go get me a quote from this, go get me a claim, go get me, um, go verify this and so on. And what we've been trying to do is think about how do systems look when you have attestation just as a service of that environment. So that means on top of that, we then we, we don't talk about remotely attesting systems. We, we start thinking about building attestations that integrate and enhance the attestation environment. And one of the biggest things we actually did was make the decision that to, to tell people that the remote attestation is not the part of the system that's responsible for making the trust decision. It's just the part of the system that's responsible for attesting and verifying and telling you whether it passes these attestation rules or not. It's somebody else who has the responsibility to decide whether those results state whether that system is trusted or not. And th this might sound uh, to be a little odd, but it, it actually comes to the fore when, when you get into systems where uh, the underlying network base may be unreliable. Just because you can't talk to a system does not mean it's untrusted. It just means at this point of time, it's not in a good state to be talked to. Um, the, when, when we have edge systems and what we call far edge, which is sitting out on the network anywhere, communication might have huge latencies. Uh, so we might not be able to get answers back uh, very, very quickly. We're also looking to situations where we might actually have to have attestation environments that are highly distributed. So in the railway sector, if you think now that every time a train runs over the balis, which is this communications piece of infrastructure on the track, uh, you want to check whether that thing is in a trusted state. Well, a TPM quote will take you approximately half a second to do, by which time your train could have traveled potentially, um, you know, a, a couple of hundred meters. So we, we're now starting to see latency issues coming to, in with this. And the fact that, you know, if you then have to go with a 5G network to your centralized signaling system to do the remote attestation there, this all adds up to uh, massive amounts of latency. So we're looking at how we, how we build applications on top of this that can distribute the attestation, federate the decision making, and so on. I'm going to get through this very, very quickly. Now, another part of this cloud, uh, of this stack, is exactly is really the supply chain and where are these things coming from? And we are slowly going down the route that we can no longer say, well, we're just the testing devices. What we talk about now is being able to test elements and an, and a, and an element for it to be um, admitted to this kind of environment, first of all, needs to be measurable. Can I take measurements from it? Yeah, we know how to do that with say UEFI and Mary's firmware and TPM. Um, is it a testable? Can I go get this attestation information from it in a form that I can trust? So for example, TPM2 quote is an ex excellent example of this. Is it verifiable? What rules can I um, match against this? Uh, and one of, our, one of our results here has been that, you know, even if you take the, the classic TPM quote, 
there's about 20 or 30 different kinds of rules you can actually run against this, even more if you start going into the history of the claims for a device over time and so on. Um, and then you get a very compositional trust a aspect into this. And then finally, there's the actual decision mechanism at the end, which basically says, is this thing trusted? And as we are moving down networks uh, where we have large conglomerations of systems, and especially where you've got lots of IoT devices, maybe you know, these things are drones, servers, whatever, they're all communicating with each other, we start getting this thing which we call the trust graph. Um, and then, then we actually have to start worrying about, okay, which parts of these are trusted, which parts of the system can trust other parts of the system? Is there peer-to-peer -peer trust and so on? So that's that's the supply chain part. And that, that's actually very, um, it, it's very unexplored. There's a workshop next week being run by NIST actually on this this topic, and they want to get really down into a lot of the hardware concepts in, in there. So I, I, I would suggest you... Uh, Go and take a look at this for what uh, some of the current thinking is on being able to build systems that are measurable in some sense and how far back can we push the root of trust. So having the root of trust uh, uh, in immutable ROM on your motherboard, uh, that's too far away from the true root of trust, which is way down in the supply chain, possibly with a whole bunch of OEMs and other systems. The other part of the stack, uh, the right hand part of the stack we call the analytics and we're, we're, we're ask, asking the question here is how do we respond to a trust failure just because my system um, or some part of the system has failed to come up in a trusted state does not mean um, I should be able to turn it off or it just means it's untrusted we always need to ask the question why um, there are lots of reasons for doing this, of course. Uh, first of all, I, I'd like to know when my system fails. And as the, as the systems get more complex, I want to know precisely what's causing those failures uh, so I can actually go and remedy this. Uh, so we're building up uh, forensics mechanisms, analytics over those forensics. Uh, we're getting into what the response mechanisms are. So we have, in our case, attestation applications that monitor our, our remote attestation environment. Um, as attestation progresses, if a failure occurs, then we start going through a very extensive forensics procedure, gathering historical information, reattesting the device, pulling claims from, looking at the devices that it's talked to recently, maybe looking at attestation at other levels in the environment, say attestation at the 5G core versus, say, attestation at the uh, edge cloud level, building up a picture of exactly what's going on in the system, and then orchestrating a proper mitigated response to that. Uh, now, I'm very, because I've been working in safety critical systems, I'm very, very against the idea of let's turn the system off. Um, that's not uh, an acceptable solution in many, well, in pretty much any safety critical system. The last thing you want to do upon a trust failure is basically say, I'm going to shut the system down. Um, now, um, I don't know about you, but if you're a patient in a hospital and somebody says, well, hey, you know, I've got the wrong attested value from this machine here, let's kill the patient because, you know, that, that's, that's a good result. Um, that, that's not acceptable. So we, we need to start thinking about how uh, trusted systems fit into these wider systems where uh, we have to handle trust in much, much more sophisticated forms and what kind of responses and orchestrations to those trust failures uh, we, we actually need to build into there. On top of this, uh, then we have uh, the applications that we've been looking at. And th there's, a, there's a whole bunch of things that then start to come out of here. We, we have um, ideas uh, such as data provenance. Um, if you can pull data out of a device, what, you know, and we, can, we already know that we can, say, run this over um, a secure channel through using TLS or SSH or whatever and, and so on. Um, if, for example, uh, say a TLS session can be built up by using, say, the TPMs at either end, then you get a little bit more information about the trustworthiness of that connection. Um, so you can generate keys on the fly. We can build up certificates and check all, all those. We also have a, a large number of data structures like um, the JavaScript, uh, the JSON web token. I keep saying JavaScript, apologies, um, where we can also add additional metadata in, inside there. Why not add metadata, say, about the data that about the the current trusted state of that device? Uh, why not uh, integrate our data plane and our control planes then with, say, the attestation environment? Um, and by doing this, actually, we then enable some very very interesting use cases. So, in application domains such as railway signaling or even uh, remote medicine, 
the ability for uh, end-to-end trust uh, for a command or a piece of data then becomes paramount. So I- imagine the situation where you have a, a doctor at a remote hospital being able to send commands to a remote device. Um, we can actually, not only can we build, we can secure that data channel, but we can also make sure that the devices at either end are tested. And also that data packet, not only did it come from a very, very specific device, but we can also talk about what state that device was in. Now, going quickly back to supply chain, we've got work going on at the moment uh, looking at the at the container build chain. Uh, so, for example, uh, while we have mechanisms like Docker Trust, we actually do not do not have information in there about in which environment they were built on. Now, look at the Solar Winds attack where uh, we had software being built on a compromised system. Um, in a lot of these systems that we're looking at now, we would like also to be able to attest the build chain, the build environment, and actually have that information recorded with the piece of software, you know, the container image or whatever it is uh, that's coming along there. And then that, of course, has some very um, in, interesting uh, implications for things like notarization and also transparency logs, which we're actually uh, starting to place some of this information in as well. And what we built at Nokia Bell Labs is that we have a common demonstrator base by which we can start exploring these concepts. So we hook this up um, to various edge clouds. We can deploy them. We've got a 5G infrastructure underneath. Um, we've got a lot of our analytics software sitting on the side, and then we start to build with these applications on top. Um, I, yeah. We hopefully towards the end of this year, we'll start looking into much deeper trust failure analytics. Uh, meaning that when we start when we start deploying this in uh, railway medical systems, we've got some preliminary results already. Uh, we can actually start looking at what kind of trust failures are we are seeing and how these trust failures are actually manifesting themselves in the system. You know, if you think that you're a you know you're a locomotive driver or a, a railway signal or a doctor. Uh, you're going to start seeing failures in your system. And the one thing that you do not have time to, or nor the expertise, is to start going into the trusted aspects of the system. You know, uh, as a railway signal, the last thing you want to do is start debugging firmware to find out why your train has just run past a red signal. That's not acceptable. So when we start going into these application domains, we need to figure out um, what kinds of information, uh, what kinds of effects are they having at this very, very high level, and how... Uh, how we might actually record this and analyze this using things like FMEA, RCA, and so on. So we we have um, two proof of concepts uh, actually running at the moment. One of them is a railways demonstrator, and this was done by a student of mine last year, a guy called Ronnie Beckman, who's now Finland's uh, railways cybersecurity expert. Um, we, we built um, a, a small version of the Finnish railway network um, and then started looking at um, how we would go and uh, integrate trusted components there, how remote attestation would fit in, and how we injected faults and attacks into the system. And this work is now being taken on by uh, a university in Uvascular uh, who are building a cyber range system uh, where they have a much, much more sophisticated example showing how we attack railway systems. And they've started working with hardware in the loop um, examples of this. Railway security is probably 20 years behind what we would think of being good IoT security these days, uh, if you're wondering. Um, then we've also uh, actually in the in the in the lab I have uh, here in Helsinki or in Espo, actually, um, we, we've we've built a small uh, remote hospital example. Um, because of COVID, we repurpose some things, and the grey box you see in the middle here is the world's. Or it, it, not only is it is it's the world's first ventilator with a trusted platform module inside, but it's also the world's most secure piece of medical equipment that I've ever come across. Um, I won't show you pictures of exactly what's inside this box, but basically we built our own ventilator system. Um, the devices inside, it's built out of Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, which doesn't sound very sophisticated, but it's uh, just as good as any. Uh, real medical device you build, you find on the market. It, there are a large number of TPMs inside for each of the components. Uh, we've got a little bit of customized firmware in there to prop some form of measured boot, or at least we, we fake it. We've got local attestation with inside this. Uh, and this device then is also being, uh, I, I, so all the devices at the moment, are, while they're communicating over Wi-Fi, so it's a loosely coupled uh, edge cloud network inside, so we can actually reconfigure this very, very quickly on the fly for different treatments. Um, it has its own attestations uh, environment inside that. And when we 
uh, when we start sticking 5G modems in this, this thing will then take advantage of things such as 5 and 6G slicing, or 5G slicing is the main concept, uh, and there will be attestation within the 5G core. So this thing will actually be able to be uh, partitioned away uh, from other parts of the networks using the 5G slicing mechanisms. And then we've got communication between two levels of attestation, one worrying about the 5G core and the user equipment, and the other one actually worrying about the devices inside this at the at the edge cloud level. And what we've what we will be demonstrating with this is actually running things like trusted data, uh, trusted data provenance. We'll be attacking the system, showing how firmware uh, attacks and into or what we'll call integrity failure attacks actually then start. Um, uh, bit, how how they emerge then and how they are presented, say, to the domain experts. Um, okay, so that was a slightly further example of that. Um, we, we've also done a lot of work on failure classifications using root cause uh, analysis. We built a whole bunch of root cause analysis or failure trees uh, um, for, uh, in, in this case, this was just uh, asking the question, okay, this device has failed its uh, TPM2 quote attestation. What are all the, um, what are all the ways we can actually uh, diagnose this? And you know, what are the root causes for a TPM2 quote actually having the wrong attested value? Now it actually turns out, and this is just a small fragment of the tree, um, just by analyzing the, the simple TPMS attest structure that you get from a TPM, there's about, we believe about 80 or 90 different paths through the, through the root cause analysis before you can say exactly where the failure occurred. And that's, that's without the larger context of say where that server or where that IoT device actually fits in with our data center with the rest of the edge cloud and all the context that it's running in, such as you know the update mechanisms, workload management, what's running on it, et cetera, et cetera. So dealing with failures actually turns out to be a remarkably complex uh, task that as, as far as we can see, nobody's ever really sat down and actually worked out, um, well, we, we know why trust failures and integrity failures happen. You know, somebody updates the firmware, reboots the system. They're very easy. But the larger context and how you actually diagnose this hasn't been done at all. Um, so yeah, like I said, we, we've we've also got some high level work looking how we integrate FMEA with the RCA and actually doing this um, in an automated fashion. Um, we're also trying to look at how it fits in with existing procedures. And this is some of the work that we're doing in Uvascular with the railways is, how a trust, how an integrity failure or trust failure is then dealt with in the procedures for dealing with a more general failure within the system. So, um, in summary, because I'm actually coming up to about 23 minutes, I'd like to take some questions as well. Uh, yeah, digitalization, we know it's critical. We we need a trusted computing base in there. Um, we or I've been concentrating on the classic TPM 2.0 plus remote attestation, but also looking at more exactly where it fits in with this. So. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with any remote attestation mechanism. I prefer mine, of course, because it's brilliant. Um, you, know, I'm, I'm, you know, if somebody swaps out TPM2 for Open Titan or whatever mechanism you have under there, I'm quite happy. Just give me something that's measurable, attestable, verifiable, and then I can make a decision over it within a much more generic attestation mechanism. And then the, the bulk of the work that we're doing now is really looking at how we start integrating this with the supply chain on one side, and then the safety critical uh, preserving responses, the resiliency responses on the other side. So how a trust failure is then actually diagnosed and how the system responds to that without taking down the entire system, which is not an acceptable uh, solution for the, the systems that we're looking at or any system or any critical system in general.